baby, I'm a fool for you. Staying safe at the Renaissance Fair. Basically, don't die. Welcome, Traveler. Today, we will be discussing how you can attend your first, or maybe not your first, Ren Fair and not be a complete dummy. Many of us in the Ren Fair world jumped right into it without doing any sort of research. And for a lot of us, that's how we do things. That is how we roll. But I know that there are some of us who don't work like that and need a little bit of information before jumping into something. And that is perfectly valid. I know that when trying something new or something you haven't done in a long time, it can be very anxiety inducing. Fortunately for me, I have a very enthusiastic partner. My husband is incredibly outgoing, so that has helped to buffer me in a lot of these situations where I get to try things new but have someone to rely on. But not everyone has that. Some people need to prepare, they need to research, and they need to figure things out before they go. Also, there's a lot of things that I wish I knew, a lot of mistakes that I made that I feel like I can provide so that you do not have a bad experience. Allow me to shield you from the mistakes that I've made. My goal is for you to have the best time and not die and not get sick or not get ripped off. Because even though Ren Fairs are amazing, they are fun, there are still some cons to go along with the pros. I am careful to say dangers, but let's be honest, if you go anywhere in public these days, especially in the United States, there will always be dangers. And when it comes to Ren Fairs, it has its own unique set of challenges that hopefully I will help you to avoid. So of course, the first question is, how do I even find a Ren Fair? Now, as much as I wanna be a complete Lancelot, and say Google is free, I will actually give you some practical tips on how to find a local rent fair. A lot of people tell me that they don't have rent fairs in their area, especially people in the UK or Europe. They'll say, oh, too bad. I don't have those here. But you'd be surprised when you train your algorithm how many things pop up. I myself have gotten suggested many rent fairs that happen to happen in the UK and in Europe. Can I go to those? No, but it serves as a lesson that things sometimes happen without us knowing even right under our noses. So the number one thing that I will suggest is get comfortable using social media for finding events. Lately, a lot of businesses and event coordinators have been using targeted ads. So if you are immersed in fantasy and Ren Faire content, likely you will be served those ads. That's actually how I found a lot of fairs and events. I was served a targeted ad by by Instagram or Facebook. Now, if you want to find it manually, I would suggest getting familiar with the hashtags that people use, like these right here. Also, when you go through hashtags for events that have just happened, you never know, you might stumble across one that happened in your area. Just check the geotag in case they tag the local fair. Also, I know it was a joke, but honestly, you may not think that you're gonna find it just by Googling it, but if you have your location on on Google, you can just search Ren Fairs near me and it'll bring up hopefully if it works well fairs that might be in your immediate area now if there aren't any like close close it might show you some that are in like maybe a further distance they might be a bit of a drive but it at least helps you to start somewhere not all of the fairs that happen are going to be listed on google some of them are small and they don't know anything about seo but at least it's a place to start because if you're able to track down a facebook page a lot of times people will like that page and sometimes other events will like that page as well so you might be able to see other event coordinators that might have liked it or maybe that specific fair has liked other fairs or are following them. You can also search on Facebook, just type in Renaissance Fair, have your location on and see what pops up. I would say that when it comes to search engine wise, Google and Facebook will, will be your best friend. If a fair doesn't have its own website that pops up on Google, they will most likely have a Facebook page or Facebook group. So definitely utilize those. And if you are familiar with the Ren Fair community on social media, you're more likely to discover other fairs because a lot of us travel and go to other fairs. I'm in Sacramento and there isn't technically a fair super close by. The closest one is probably Folsom, not my fave. So I am willing to venture out and go to other California fairs. I think the longest I've driven for a fair is three hours and the furthest I've traveled via plane is Colorado. But if you just want to get your toes wet and try something that's super local, also expand your parameters. Also look up Celtic fairs and Scottish festivals 
festivals and fairs. A lot of those are put on by people that also do Ren fairs. You'll see a lot of the same vendors. Sometimes the clans will show up, like the Scottish clan, the bagpipes people, the kings and queens, the, the historical dressers. A lot of those people will show up. So since there is quite a bit of an overlap with those types of events, a lot of times the environment will be very similar. So definitely don't rule that out. I know there is a, it's either a Celtic or a Scottish festival in San Jose. That's actually my first experience with anything that's similar to a Ren Fair. I didn't grow up going to Ren Fairs because as far as I knew, they only happened in Oregon and Southern California, at least the ones that were close to me. I only within the last few years have gotten into Ren Fairs because they have become more popular. They're a bit more accessible. They're a bit easier to find with social media. So keep that in mind too, since they are rising in popularity, there are new events that are popping up, especially in Europe and the UK, since it's becoming popular, fairy core and night core and D&D &D and fantasy in general is becoming such a huge cultural movement. A lot of event coordinators are starting to put together these events. One thing I've seen a lot pop up in the UK specifically are fey balls or fantasy balls. We have quite a few that are happening here in the US, but my For You page on TikTok keeps showing me the most beautiful events that are happening and they're always in the UK. And I'm like, I don't have my passport. I don't have the money to travel. And just in general, when it comes to being part of the community and learning and finding out where things are happening, you could also see if there are any Facebook groups that you can join, as well as seeing if there's any Ren Faire subreddits. So let's start from the beginning. What time should you get there? That is honestly going to depend on you. Do, are you an early person? Do you want to get as much out of this event as possible? If so, I would recommend getting there at open. Every fair has a different opening time, but usually it's around 9 to 10 a.m. Now, if it's a bigger event, I would recommend getting in the immediate area sooner than that because parking can be a beast and there can be a lot of traffic. So now we're going to get into the bigger topics and that is what should I bring? So I have split this up into different categories to make it a little bit easier to organize. So the very first topic is moolah, money, coin, rubies. I would say that the number one tip for Ren fairs or any type of festival environment is to bring cash and bring as much cash as you can afford to take out. The reason for that is because that is what most vendors prefer, especially food vendors. A lot of times with food vendors, if they do take card, they have a $10 minimum. So if you're just getting a water, it's best to have cash. And then with a lot of artisans and artists and merchants, even if they do have a card reader, they have to get one of those mobile ones that has like a service fee. So they would very much prefer cash as well. And then there's the issue that a lot of fares, at least in California, do charge for parking. And I have never seen a um, an event that takes card for parking. And you don't wanna be that a-hole that holds up the line because you're rummaging through your car trying to find enough change and see if you find any $1 bills under your seat. Yeah, get cash beforehand. And that's always one thing I always forget and like when we're scrambling. And I would suggest if you're able to hit up an ATM or you could even go to a store and if they have cash back, just pick up a few things that I might mention later that you might need, get cash. Because if it's a bigger fare, they will have ATMs, but they charge fees as well. So little hindsight helps out a lot. And then the last point about this is that if there are performers or food service people in the United States, it is common practice to tip service workers and performers. It's not like that with every country. I, I don't know how it is in the UK or Europe, but here we do tip because we get paid garbage money. And a lot of, at least the performers are working are working for tips and then I don't know how much the food service workers are being paid but I doubt it's a lot so and they're in the hot sweaty stall and just be nice and tip them if you can if you're paying with card and they have like the square sometimes you can tip that way but cash is better this is kind of a it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it subject which is why I'm kind of touching on this first and that is first aid now usually big events they do have staff that have first aid training that if you get a boo-boo or something they can give you a band-aid but you don't want to take away from people that have actual medical needs 
and ask for like a band-aid or like an antiseptic wipe or something. So I would suggest getting a small travel size first aid kit. Now I got this one from the drugstore because I like ripped my nail off and I needed a band-aid. Fun times. It's super tiny, it's just a little case. And you know, it's filled with the drugstore brand of band-aids and wipes, but the great thing is you can refill these and keep using them and put them in your bag. Since it's so small, this could fit in a belt bag or a small purse or satchel. Don't worry, we're gonna be covering bag situations, but this is really good to have. Also, if you get a blister, you wore the wrong shoes because you're an idiot and you need a band-aid to help cushion it, this is really helpful. Or if you fall and scrape your knee or your kid scrapes their knee, have one of these. And then for sanitary reasons, because sometimes there aren't any um, non-porta potty hole in the ground, there aren't any flushable toilets with warm water and soap, get yourself some wipes. Yes, hand sanitizer is great, but there's nothing better than feeling like all the bits are off your hands. So I just grabbed the, one of these from the travel section at Target. If you're bougie and you need the more natural ones, they make those too. Whole Foods, Sprouts, whatever store you have in your area area, the non chemical -y ones, just whatever you can get, bring something because most Ren fairs, at least the ones I've been to, have porta potties. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes they'll have the portable sinks and soap, but again, it's cold water. I mean, it's better than nothing, but. And then the last thing in this subject is kind of in the realm of first aid. I always make sure I have my preferred painkiller with me, like Tylenol, Advil, Ibuprofen, whatever it is that you prefer. Get like a little container and bring that with you. If you don't need it, someone else might need it. You know, you're out in the sun, maybe you didn't drink enough water. Drink, we're gonna cover that too, don't you worry. But just having it just in case, even if you don't like to take those things. I'm, I, I was raised by hippies. I hate taking those things, but again, it's better to have it and not need it, you know, mm -hmm. again. Now, another very important subject that a lot of people just, they can't get in, the, in their brain to take care of ahead of time or have forethought and then they end up in the ambulance is sun protection, which we're also gonna cover hydration as well. These kind of go hand in hand, but first and foremost, protecting yourself from the sun and protecting yourself from the heat. Don't be like me and forget and become a lobster. I am white. Though I have an Italian side of me where my family members that took after that genetics, they tan flawlessly and they don't burn. I took after my dad's Scottish side, the Irish, Scottish, English, and I just burn. So this is a, this is very near and dear to my heart because I came back from Colorado with a huge freaking blistered chest, not pretty burn. So, so don't forget your sunscreen kids at Colorado. They actually were reminding people before they went in and I still forgot, but whatever your preferred SPF is bring that you can apply it when you get to the parking lot. It's better to do that. If you can't, if it's too big of a bottle to bring with you, at least plan on exiting at some point and reapplying because a lot of people don't realize that you have to reapply your SPF. And usually the more natural ones, you have to do it more often. I got a really tiny version of like one of the more bougie brands from Target. And it says to apply every two hours. It was a small enough thing to where I could put it in my little bag. So I had it with me. I didn't have to go back out. But a lot of people will bring like those like big spray ones. And those are great for families because it's quick, easy. If you don't like the chemicals, look up information on whatever SPF you need to bring. But just bring it because that is uh, one of the reasons why people end up um, in trouble. So definitely take heed. If your fair does not have a lot of shade, which that's something you might be able to look up beforehand, I would recommend looking it up. One thing you can bring is a parasol. And if you're very creative, you can even decorate your parasol ahead of time and make it part of your outfit. Now, parasols are different than umbrellas, though they structurally look the same. With actual true parasols that have sun protection, the outside will just have like whatever fabric, you know, it has, but the inside will have some sort of like UV blocking that will keep you cool underneath there. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. You can bring just an umbrella. I mean, it provides some shade, but I would recommend looking into getting an actual parasol. And then if it's not pretty enough, just decorate it. Get some moss, get some flowers, put some foliage on it and make it part of your little fairy outfit if you're going as a fairy. I want to make a mushroom one. That's my goal. And I brought a parasol to the Plymouth one and that was very very helpful because it was very hot at that fair and there was not a lot of shade and mine wasn't fancy it didn't have like the double layer but it was still 
helpful. A lot of people don't realize that what is responsible for your heat situation isn't just how hot it is if you're in the sun, but it's also what you're wearing. So be careful to not wear synthetic fabrics or too many synthetic fabrics. Specifically, polyester and rayon are the most popular or most common synthetic fabric. A lot of those keep heat trapped, so you're more likely to um, sweat and overheat. Now, sweating is your body's natural response to heat to try to cool you down, but if there's no way for any air to escape, it's not gonna help. So I recommend making sure your outfit is mostly cotton, linen. I've even heard that wool, even though it can be thick, it is moisture wicking and it is breathable. Just use your better judgment and put together an outfit that's gonna be able to breathe. A lot of people, they have to cover up in order to keep from getting heat stroke. So if that is you and you don't wanna use sunscreen and you wanna stay mostly covered, make just make sure it's a natural fiber. Just don't layer up too much. And might I suggest a hand fan, especially one that is pretty, that looks good with your outfit. And if you bring a fan, you can put a fan holster on your belt. This has come in handy so many times. I will link this down below. Now hydration, this goes hand in hand because you don't want to die and your body needs water. And what happens when you are in the heat and you're sweating, you lose water and you also lose electrolytes. So my number one tip, obviously, besides drink water is also make sure you are hydrating with electrolytes. A lot of people's go-to is Gatorade. Gatorade. H2O. Some people have dietary restrictions like diabetes where something that's high in sugar is not ideal. Plus there's a lot of artificial dyes and colors in Gatorade but you do you boo do what works for you but if you're looking for an alternative to Gatorade you can also get these electrolyte packs this is one of the most popular brands and the one I hear people talk about the most and I really like it it's called liquid IV I've also tried a different brand that has different flavors that's really nice I feel like kids would like that one more if your doctor or your pediatrician is okay with that just make sure you check the ingredients and check the fine print yeah this is really nice I forgot to bring it to the Colorado Ren Fair and we ended up just buying Gatorade but it was fine now when it comes to hydration a lot of fairs say that they don't allow outside food or drink which is unfortunate and if they're very strict about that the great thing is that those are just powder packets you can bring those with you and then when you get into the fair you can purchase some water or if they have like a drinking fountain might I suggest bringing a tankard or bottles that you can like have decoratively strung onto your belt so have this one you can have several if like you can't find a one big enough. My therapist has always told me that I have the tendency to bottle up my emotions. And you can have fun with it. Like with these, I would really love to put like Gatorade or another like fun colored drink into it and add edible glitter and make it like a potion. Now, if I'm unable to bring my Gatorade in, obviously I'd probably bring one of my, my little powders. I can't remember if the flavored ones, the other one, if they have color in them, but I feel like if you had this on your belt and it looked decorative, they wouldn't, they wouldn't mind. At Colorado, they weren't very picky, especially because they don't want people passing out and having to call the ambulance. A couple other alternatives to those is you can get a drinking horn. Some of those you can actually seal, like a bottle. A lot of them that aren't though, they're like cups. People also like to use wine skins. They look cool, but also you can use them like a canteen. So those are just some ways to make sure you have water on you. If you, if they're like super strict, they won't let you even bring in your bottle of water, which they should. It's so dumb if they don't. You could always keep like a cooler in your car full of water so that if you need to go out to your car, and hydrate you can now again there should be water stations sinks water fountains you can also just refill side note though a lot of food stands especially if you're looking overheated they will fill your bottle or your cup with water if you ask Ren Fair workers are extremely nice here's another thing you might be tempted to drink ice cold water if you are really hot that is the thing that people traditionally do however if you're really hot and dehydrated might I suggest not drinking ice cold water because that will actually do more harm than good the water that you drink actually has to be at body temperature in order for your body to be able to use it. At least that's what I've heard. Don't quote me on that. But if you're drinking ice cold water, your body has to work harder in order to use that water. And also our body does not like extremes. So if you are extremely hot and red and sweaty, you feel like you're going to 
faint. If you then drink ice cold water, it might put you into shock. I learned this the hard way. I got heat sick after the Plymouth Fair and I was so hot, we ended up getting in like a snow cone. In the moment, I felt really nice because it cooled me down, but then I started to feel really sick. So if you would like to enjoy an ice cold beverage or a snow cone, just make sure you cool down slower. Don't go from one extreme to another. Also, if there is a building that has a C, don't go from the hot, hot to the cold, cold. Try to acclimate yourself first. Try to cool down a little bit in shade before you go into like the 65 degree building. That has also messed me up. That actually happened to me at Disneyland where I was overheated and then we went into an AC area and I ended up being extremely tired and nonverbal for a few hours and I was not feeling good. So just be careful when it comes to heat. When in doubt, if you're feeling really bad, get the attention of a staff member, someone that can get someone in first aid to help you out. And if you notice someone in your party seems a little bit faint, seems a little bit overheated, do what you can to help cool them down, but also don't be afraid to ask for help if needed. One of the things I have seen so many times at fairs is the paramedics having to come and help. So just be careful, guys. I personally have not encountered very many cold fairs in my time. The only one that I did was the one in Angel's Camp. And it was not that cold. It was just chilly because it was stormy. And there was a tornado. I don't have a lot of experience with cold fairs yet. If I do, I will make an I will make a second video about winter fairs. How about that? Now, when it comes to food, obviously you might run into the issue again of them not allowing outside food or drink, but I still think it's very important to try to at least bring some snacks. If you can't bring it in, at least leave it in your car. The reason for this is because you never know how long the wait times are gonna be for the food vendors. If it's a large fair, they'll usually have a really big selection of food vendors, both the regular stands as well as the ones that walk around with carts so you might have more access to food and to snackage but if you go to a fair that is smaller but then has increased in popularity before the fair has been able to expand like Folsom there might be a long wait time for food and the line might be in the Sun so at least having a quick option so you do not get hangy and then some of us have the issue of uh, getting getting real faint from low blood sugar. Bring whatever snackage uh, suits your fancy, whatever you prefer. I'm not a fan of protein bars, but like a lot of people like protein bars because they have a good amounts of macros in order to get you sustained. I like, I'm a child, so I like my goldfish crackers and my Cheez-Its. I'm not a fan of trail mix, but I do like some nuts. These nuts? Things that will make you feel fresh and renewed. Just nothing that's too high in sugar because if you already have like low blood sugar issues, that'll kind of spike it and then I'm not a nutritionist, but I have had experience where I was like super low blood sugar and then I ate a cookie and then it made me feel worse. So just be careful. Next, a lot of people have asked me, what purse or bag should I bring? This is honestly up to your own preference. If you want your bag to be more on the practical side and not necessarily be on the more aesthetic side, I do feel like there are some middle ground options. So I'm going to show you those. This is one of my favorite bags to bring to the rent fair when I'm packing, when I'm actually bringing a lot of stuff with me. I've brought my snacks and all the aforementioned things like some of my camera gear. This is by Leafling Bags, which is a channel favorite. When I don't bring this into the fair, I'll at least have my essentials in here and leave it in the car in the trunk. But I have not yet done a fair, at least in a while, without one of these leaf pouch bags. This is surprisingly roomy. I have a small wallet and I can fit that plus my phone, plus my chapstick and my tiny little sunscreen. I also have a lot of different colors to choose from. I have these two and then I have a black one and then a chocolate brown. These are really great, uh, especially when I just wanna go one bag. I also have a satchel from Eco Suzy. I'll link whatever I can down in the description. And then this is a bag that my husband likes to bring. It it's It's pretty flat, so you can't really fit any bulky items, but when it comes to like the wipes, the first aid kit, anything that's like small and can like be stuffed in here. This is a shield bag from Zelda and I actually went in and weathered it. We got this off of Amazon a few years ago. If it's still available, I'll link it. This is what it looks like on the inside. It has like multiple pockets, which is really good for organization. And it looks really cool with his outfit too. Like it's practical, but it also is 
decorative. So whenever he brings that, usually I'll put all these other little items in there that we might need. And then in my own little belt bag, that's where I'll put like my phone, my wallet, my lip stuff, and then that's it. And I try to keep things super light, not bring a lot on me because I get overwhelmed easily. And if I have too much to look after, I end up losing it. So that is what I suggest as far as bags go. There are other options, but that's what I use personally. What should I wear? Obviously wear what is most comfortable for you. You are gonna be on your feet a long time and probably be doing a lot of walking. So the number one important thing besides wearing, you know, natural fibers and not overheating is your footwear. Because I don't know about you, but if my feet hurt, my day is ruined. How do you feel? <laughs> of course, I'm gonna suggest shoes that kind of go with your outfit, but if the shoes aren't comfy, but I also don't suggest wearing tennis shoes because depending on the terrain, depending on the weather, that can be impractical, especially if there's a lot of slopes, if there is a lot of inclines and declines, if there is mud, there's a lot of factors that can play into it. So I wouldn't suggest like tennis shoes, flip flops, sandals in general, although there's a lot of Renfair goers that will wear like their medieval looking sandals or like little flats. You know, they prob they're probably made of leather. They're probably like pros at this point point. But if you are new or if you are finicky like me, if you're neurodivergent or if you're just clumsy, I would recommend anything with a good amount of tread, a good thick sole. I'll show you my favorite pair of shoes to wear actually. And that is these. These are by Doc Martin. These are the Leona shoes in black. These are real leather, so they're extra flexible and they are at this point molded to my foot. But when it comes to Docs, these were the easiest to break in. But as you can see, it has very good tread, like very like spiky tread. It has a very thick sole. So I've worn these to several fairs and my feet did not hurt and the terrain was pretty easy to trek. We did get a lot of hills in Colorado. Now I know these are not the most fantasy or the most medieval looking shoes. They still kind of work with my outfit but they are the best shoes that I've found. Now someday I'll probably invest in an actual like run fair, medieval, accurate pair of shoes, but I really wanna invest in something that is really good quality, that will last me forever, and that will be super comfortable. So for now, these are my run fair shoes and I love it. And I always get a lot of compliments on my shoes actually. And then as far as what you should wear, a lot of people ask me to style them or help them make outfits, which I'm totally willing to do. But in this video, there's a lot of information that I'm presenting. So I'm actually going to save specifics on how to put together outfits. In another video, I'm gonna show examples and things like that. I do have a couple videos that I've already made where I talk about how to thrift for Ren Fair. So if you haven't watched those videos, I will have them linked down below or in the Ren Fair playlist. And just keep in mind though, in the future that there will be another video popping up where I will be showing more outfits. I also have a series from TikTok where I kind of did that thing, putting together outfits, but I do wanna kind of update it since that was from a year ago. So if you're watching this video, and it says that I posted this recently. Stick around, subscribe, keep your eyes peeled. If you're watching this and it's been months since I posted this video, definitely check to see if I posted it. And if I haven't, remind me. Another thing that I've been asked a lot lately is about trinkets and trinket trading. I wasn't actually familiar with trinkets and trinket trading until recently, so I haven't really had an opportunity to do a lot. I was informed of it before I went to the Colorado Ren Fair, but I didn't have enough time to prepare. Do you need to make your trinkets? No, you can buy them. What, what trinkets can you give out. Honestly, anything. I was given like a painted rock or those little glass beads from like, you know, what they used to weigh down vases. It could be anything. And if you're wondering what is trinket trading, it's basically where you might have a positive interaction with one of your fellow Ren Fair goers. And they give you a little trinket or maybe they're in character and they do a little magic trick and then they hand you a trinket. A lot of people that have been going to Ren Fairs for years also like to give little trinkets to kids when they ask for pictures or if just a Ren Fair goer asks for a picture. And some Sometimes whenever you meet someone and you're having a great interaction, they'll ask to trade trinkets. So if you have a trinket, they have a trinket. But do not worry if you didn't bring anything. A lot of people are super nice about just giving you things. I came home with quite a few little trinkets and I actually have one pinned to my corset. I really like that they made this little string of beads, very tiny, probably didn't take that long to make, uh, probably inexpensive, but then they attached it to a safety pin. So I didn't have to stick it in my pocket. I just attached it to my corset. So in the future, when I make my own trinket, for my upcoming fairs. I 
plan on attaching mine to little pins as well so people can display them. So they're just like a cute little token that you give out when you make a friend, when you have a really nice interaction just to enhance the experience. Specifically for kids, it makes their day. And I know a lot of people help their kids to make their trinkets before they go or acquire trinkets. It's, it's honestly adorable and it brings a smile to everyone's face. So you're going to the fair and you want to buy some stuff, but you're also afraid that you will be charged hand over fist for some crappy Amazon thing by a reseller that is dubiously presenting it as their own creation. Unfortunately, that happens a lot. Now, there are a lot of fairs that outlaw that. If a vendor is to rent a booth at their event, they have to sign a contract to not sell Amazon, AliExpress, Timu items, things that were bought in bulk from a wholesaler. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't get their supplies from a wholesaler. Obviously, there's people that will buy beads and individual little items to make their wares and then they'll put it together with their own creativity. That is different. We are talking people that buy things off of wholesalers and just sell them as is. How do you tell if that is the case? Well, if you can't tell just by looking at it, I would suggest if you are able to get away with taking a picture of the item, you can actually use Google reverse image on the Google app in order to look up where else that product has shown up and it'll show you. And if it pops up on Timu, Amazon, AliExpress, ding, 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 you might have an idea. Amazon themselves actually have a way to take a picture of an item and search by picture as well. So definitely utilize that. Now, if after you've done that, that and either nothing came up or something came up, you still should use your better judgment to analyze the item. If you're allowed to touch it, I would touch it. If it feels cheap, if the item is gold, but it's like very, very yellow, or if the leather smells like chemicals and plastic and it's kind of plasticky, you know that it's probably not an original item or they use cheap materials. Leather has a very distinctive smell. It's very earthy. It's very musky. A lot of the wares that are sold at Ren Fairs are are like leather and wood and metal and you can really tell when something is genuine like leather is soft and malleable sometimes you'll get like the more rigid leather items but it's it has a very distinctive look it, if you've been around leather and you still can't tell the difference it might be faux leather but just a very good quality one leather lasts forever whereas faux leather tends to break down a lot quicker and then you have to replace so if an item is like super duper expensive at the fair but it's real leather that is an investment piece especially if it's something that you plan on using. So like mugs and with mug straps, um, wine skins, like there are specific items that you might buy at a fair that you might use at future fairs and future events that you will get your money's worth because they will be with you for years. Also, another thing to note is just because you found the item on a website like Shein, Wish, Timu, AliExpress, doesn't mean that this person committed the crime of buying a cheap knockoff on those places in bulk. They could actually be the original original artist. Most of the products that you see on those websites have been stolen from original designers and artists. So just be aware of that. Maybe check the shop's Instagram, talk to the shop owner or whoever is working it just to get familiar with who they are, what they represent, what their story is, because you might find an original artist who has been ripped off. And you don't have to be big and famous to be ripped off by those companies. Shein will steal from small artists all the time. So just be wary of that. Don't be accusatory. The thing is, if, you, if it is a quality product, it won't even register in your mind that it could be from Amazon. So there's that as well. But if you have a reasonable suspicion, obviously look into it and just don't buy it. I, I say if you find out that it's from AliExpress, I wouldn't call them out. I would just be like, oh, okay, and move on. Don't cause any problems. So this brings up the question, what is worth it to buy? Like I said, anything that's practical that you will use, either in your cosplays, run fairs, or even in your daily life, I suggest just that like I love getting like cups and stuff but as far as like fun things definitely corsets from makers I actually got this from a girl in Australia she made this for me and then she sells these I wore this to Colorado Ren Fair but even when I went to the fair I bought a corset jewelry is super fun especially when it's handmade my husband loves swords but a lot of the swords are from manufacturers and aren't handmade so you find one at one fair you can find them elsewhere as well like at other fairs so keep that in mind, especially if you're traveling, you don't want to weigh yourself down. 
So honestly, anything that's one of a kind, especially if you're traveling, is what I would say is worth it to buy. And anything that's gonna bring you joy. But if you have the money to buy the thing and it's gonna make you happy, even if it's not a unique item, I would say just buy it. If you wanna buy the Strider sword, if you wanna buy the King sword, buy it. If you can afford it, treat yourself. The next question is obviously, what shows are worth it to see? Again, this is all up to you, babe. All up to you. What do you call a drunk playwright? Shakespeare. <laughs> Personally, I love the joust. Every fair kind of handles the joust differently. The show is at different levels. The Hollister Fair, the NorCal Run Fair, is my personal favorite so far because it was a whole tournament. Every location is gonna be different in as far as like the demand, like how early you have to get there to get good seats. For the Hollister NorCal Run Fair, you had to get there like an hour and a half early if you wanted to get good seats in the bleachers. Otherwise, you couldn't you couldn't actually enter the arena to see it and they would hold people back from the entrance because it's like too close to where the action's happening. But when you first get there, I would suggest getting a map, even if the map is crap when it comes to navigation, at least there should be a schedule on there. Sometimes there's a schedule pre-posted on their Facebook pages or their website. Take note of that before you go. Try to figure out what you would be interested in seeing. A lot of times they will list who the actual acts are and you should be able to find their Facebook page or their Instagram or their TikTok or even their YouTube or see if anyone has uploaded their act and you can preview it and see if it's something that you really want to see live and if it's worth your time. If you see the crack show, C-R-A-I-C, on the list, see that. That is fun. I say anytime it's like live band music, it's definitely worth it. The Sword Swallower was also fun, but if you have anxiety, I wouldn't suggest that. I personally loved the petting zoo, but I'm also like a five-year-old at heart. A lot of people ask me what I use to take pictures. I personally don't like to lug in my big DSLR in fairs, especially if they're busy. Now, I have brought it with me and left it in the car or put it in someone else's bag if they're bringing a backpack and then at the end of the day, take pictures. I haven't liked to do that recently just because I don't don't want to leave my, my camera gear in the car in case it gets stolen. Recently, I've been using my phone as well as my vlog camera. I am planning on getting a, a bit snazzier of a lens so that I can take snazzier pictures with it and still feel very light and free. But honestly, like I said in my content creation video, if you have a good phone, if you have an iPhone, it should be good enough if you're creative enough and you want to take pictures. But also just pictures and videos in general, it, it's really nice to have memories, but don't let that consume you. Be in the moment and have fun. Check the weather before you go, and I say that from experience. Don't just check it a week before or even the day before. Check it the morning of because the weather changes all the time. I know it, it, it sucks if you have to cancel, but don't die. I am stubborn and I have gone anyways. When it comes to bringing props, especially weapons, be sure to look up the rules online before you go. If your fair has a website or a Facebook page, a lot of times they will have specific rules when it comes to that. It will depend on your location, your state, etc. And it'll also depend on if the fair owns the actual actual facility that they're having the, the fair, if they're like a permanent installation, or if they're just renting it out. And if they're renting it out, then likely they will have rules that have been given to them by the actual convention or fairgrounds, in addition to their own rules. But generally the rules are, if you have a prop weapon, when you first get there, you have to check in with security and they have to inspect it. What they allow, usually, you know, wood, foam, plastic are totally fine. They will put a little like, what they call peace bonding or peace tie to just signify to any security that might pass you that it's been inspected. And if you do bring a metal weapon that is either real or dulled, they will require you to keep it in its sheath if they let you take it in at all. And after they have checked it, they will actually peace bond it in a way to where you can't pull it out. Some fairs just don't let metal weapons in anyways because it could be more harm than good because what is stopping people from taking the peace bond off if they intend on harming others? And their number Number one priority for this sort of policy is the safety of the public and them not getting sued, but also people not getting hurt. So keep that in mind when you're going and if they tell you to put your prop back in your car, don't make a huge issue of it. They're just trying to do their job. They're just trying to keep people safe. Yes, you might be a totally okay guy, but they don't know that and they don't know if someone else will take your weapon from you. So just be cool, man, be cool. Some fairs will check your bag. 
at the entrance. Not all of them do. California, it's pretty standard to do bag check. They're not gonna ding you for food or drink if that fare is chill about it. What they're looking for is things that can hurt people or substances you're not supposed to have. That's all they're usually concerned about. Now, if they tell you, you can't bring this drink in. Again, don't be a jerk, but also if you have any health issues, be upfront about it. A lot of us are neurodivergent and with that come comorbidities of having um, issues with being dehydrated or low blood sugar. So just be like, hey, I'm disabled or hey, I'm this or that. And I may not have access to the thing and I need this. This isn't just for my enjoyment. This is for my survival. Like, just be honest. I've, I've had people like, go, oh, okay. They just work there. They don't want to have a fight, you know? Um, so just, just be nice. Just be courteous. When it comes to Ren Fair etiquette, it's honestly like everywhere else. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Be nice. Be courteous. Say excuse me. Say please. Say thank you. Everything that our parents taught us. Don't get in the way if there's someone with a big old prop or they're in their armor and they can't see. Just, just be chill, man. Just be chill. So there you have it, my lords and ladies. I feel like I've given you an adequate amount of information on how to conquer your first fair. Of course, many of my viewers are seasoned Ren Fair goers and anime con goers. There's a lot of overlap there. So if you are an expert or if you have lots of experience or if you've been a few times and you've learned a few things, be sure to pop your tips into the scroll below the comments. Comment down below if you have any tips that you think I missed or things that you would like to add to the conversation. Because a lot of these things I not only learned from my own experience, but I also learned from others. That's the one thing that I love about the Ren Faire community. We're all very welcoming. We're all very helpful. We want to make sure that everyone has a good time and there are always good vibes. Huzzah! And now you are no longer a dummy, a fool, a jester. <laughs>